Okay, thank you so much. Um, while doing that, we will introduce ourselves to you. I'm going to go over to Marina first. Hey folks, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Marina Barnett and I'm a faculty member, associate professor uh, at Widener University in the Center for Social Work Education. And I've been teaching for about, <laughs> about 35 years and I've been a community organizer and just um, I'm so happy to be here today. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Hadamizio. Feel free to call me Sam. Um, I use she, her pronouns and currently I'm at Boston College um, pursuing a PhD in curriculum and instruction. Um, and I also teach and do research there about um, educational philosophy as well as how space and place shape education. Um, and so a lot of my research and what I do is also absolutely shaped by uh, my undergraduate experience. So I'm a 2016 alumna from Ursinus College, where I was also a part of the Bonner Service Program there. And I also served as um, a program associate at the Bonner Foundation, which is how I was connected with my colleagues here who I'm presenting with today. So delighted to be here with you all. Thanks, Sam. And I'm Ari on, but you can call me Ari Hoy, and I serve as the Vice President for Program and Resource Development at the Bonner Foundation. We are a private foundation based in New Jersey that works in partnership with about 75 colleges and universities who have built a four-year developmental civic and community engagement program that's tied to both curricular and co-curricular life. And I've been here since 2004. Over to you, Paul. Hi everyone, I'm Paul Shadwald. I'm the senior project manager for the Paradigm Project at a national initiative called Bringing Theory to Practice. Bringing Theory to Practice is a national in initiative to advance um, integrated, engaged, and equitable educational practices. And we're housed geographically at Elon University, but I work hybrid and travel the country a lot. Currently, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I spent about 20 plus years at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota before taking this role. And I also am vice chair of the National Advisory Board for the Imagining America Consortium, which is a consortium of about 80 schools dedicated to engagement in the arts, humanities, and design. Great. Thanks so much. And our aims today are we wanted to really embody the notion of community engagement the, uh, the knowledge that we have together and our, our experiences. So we're gonna invite you to think about your own personal story as we share a little bit of our own to kind of ground us in this notion of how do we intentionally develop civic identity and work to transform education. Uh, we will later that the second half of the session, we will highlight some frameworks, lessons and models then that we've all worked on collectively and professionally and we hope that you will also share some of your own frameworks and models, and we'll invite you to do so in the chat, sharing documents and links in particular. So those are our aims. We thought it was important that we would review a little bit of the terms that we were asked to address today in this session. And so we used for reference the AACNU value rubrics. Value is the valid assessment of learning and undergraduate education. At the end of the session, we'll share a handout with you that has some links and some information where you can learn more. Um, but I won't read all of these out learning outcomes, but they, they kind of help to shape what we're thinking about how colleges and universities, in particular in the context of civic learning and community engagement, intentionally try to cultivate student civic agency, identity, diversity and intercultural competence, integrative learning, social justice, and in our work in the Bonner Network in particular, we've added place and issue knowledge too, um, because our work is, is very much grounded in uh, the spaces, in particular surrounding the college or institution where we work in a consistent developmental way. So over to you, Sam. Yeah, we just wanted to share a few of our commitments and values going into this session, um, because we know that hope, we hope anyway, that we as uh, presenters have um, some knowledge and 
frameworks that we can share, but we will also want to acknowledge that you all have expertise and knowledge in your own right, and we hope to encourage you to engage in self-reflection along with us and to share some of your knowledge and expertise with us as well. So to kick us off, each of us is going to share a brief story or snippet of our own civic identity development. And we'll highlight an experience we had as a student, a scholar, and or as a professional that has shaped us in our work today. And that's our way of kind of introducing a little bit more about our background as well. And after we speak, we'll pair people up um, and invite you to do the same. And again, part of this was based on having attended some of these sessions previously, including in the December forum, knowing that the breakouts in many ways are a time for all of us who are already very committed to this work to really get into the nitty gritty um, and share a little bit more of our own selves um, in that context. So I'm gonna stop the share because we don't have slides for that. Um, and then we can kick us off, so. So I'll start. Thanks, um, Marina. My experience uh, uh, and how I became an organizer really kind of uh, starts with my family. Um, it starts with my mother and the way in which she taught us to walk through the world. Um, we grew up in a small rural town, uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania, which is just on the Mason-Dixon line uh, in Pennsylvania. And um, I'm the youngest of nine children. Uh, the first to attend and graduate from college. And my, it, it's interesting because when I was thinking about this question, I was really thinking, well, what kind of really got me to think about, you know, how I, how I uh, approach the work that I do, particularly in, in local communities. And a lot of it had to do with my experience growing up in, in Oxford, but also the labels that put, people put on me when I went to college. And so um, an experience that just sticks in my head and, and drives me crazy all the time is an experience that I had when I was traveling. Um, I was on a trip and I was traveling from Western Pennsylvania over to the Eastern side of Pennsylvania. And I was uh, with a bunch of college students with a, a professor and she asked me a little bit about myself. I told her, I said, I'm the youngest of nine. And she, the first question that she asked me was how many fathers? And I thought, er? <laughs> and like, what a what a weird question to ask. And then she proceeded to ask me all of these questions that let me know that she didn't see who I am, um, but also um, really told me that she didn't understand anything about the African American community. She didn't understand the people. She'd never seen the people that I had grown up with, which were really proud, hardworking people, um, she was relying on some sociological stereotypes that had been developed by people that didn't even know us. And so it really helped me to kind of shape this view that I have because I wanted to tell the stories of those people. I wanted to tell the stories of the people who grew up like me, people who grew up working hard, people who grew up honest, but people who really, when it came down to it, worked together to do whatever we needed to do to make sure that everybody was thriving. And so um, that really is what shaped my experience and shapes the way that I walk through the world. And so there's another thing that I'll be really quick about. I'm a runner. And so the first thing that I do when I go anywhere is I put my sneakers on and I go and I learn the landscape and I say hello to people and I get to know people. And so I'll talk a little bit about how that factors into this asset framework that I use when I'm organizing. Thank you for that opportunity. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm happy to chime in next with the story. And um, something I wanted to think about and share today was uh, from my student experience as an undergrad um, at our Sinus College, like I said, as a part of the Bonner Service Program. And one of the common features of our program was um, many deep, harrowing, and productive conversations about race and racism. And yet in these conversations as an undergrad, um, I remember actually feeling a lot of shame and a lot of uncomfortability, discomfort around what it meant for me as an Asian American woman 
to discuss race, oftentimes in what I felt like were black and white terms. And fast forward to senior year, um, we we're having a conversation like we usually do together as a, as a group, the 30 of us. And I remember the moment where I was trying to muster up the courage to admit some of these feelings that I was having around about my own racial identity development and about how I just didn't know how to make sense of my own Asian-ness and how it fit into this conversation. And there's still a lot of feelings of shame around that. And I remember trying to well up the strength to say something. And when I did, um, it still moves me to this day that my peers responded in a loving and encouraging way that to this day still serve as a launch pad for me to work through my own racial identi identity development in my own time, a work in progress, but also to recognize how my own civic identity is deeply informed by my racial identity and um, how my participation in any community um, or collective body is really shaped by not only how others perceive me, but also in my own agency, in the words of Mari Matsuda, um, CRT scholar, to not be used. So I also have the agency to resist the ways in which my yellowness has been used as a wedge in racial politics or coalition building. And so this really, what seems like a small moment um, really catalyzed this huge transformation for me in terms of my civic identity and in a lot of the work that I participate and hope to do in the future as well. So a lot of the research that I do now is thinking about what are the conditions that allow for a student who feels like she's at the margins to feel safe enough to participate in risky but transformative learning. And so that's how, that's a lot of the work that I do today, a lot of the research um, that imbues what I hope to do in the future as well. And so um, thank you for listening and glad to share it. Pass it off to you, Ari, please. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so uh, I already have some resonance with Marina and Sam's story in many deep ways. And I grew up in Lake Tahoe, California, and my parents split up when I was about seven and I went to move, live with my great grandmother. <laughs> at the time she made me take typing and take, take classes at the community college and said, you've got to have skills so you could always get a job. And flash forward, uh, my mom was remarried and I ended up um, going to Stanford University. And I did, uh, my parents had both not, they had gone to college briefly, but not finished. Um, but there were also some assumptions, like even with people in my dorms, uh, my mom was a, a bagger and later a checker at, at the grocery store. And even in having conversations with my peers, they were like, really? You know, um, and so I had those kind of experiences. But my work study job was at the Haas Center for Public Service. And um, that, that was in the time when we had binders and it was helping students go work in East Palo Alto, in the community of East Palo Alto um, nearby the school. And that basically became my home. Um, that was where I found mentors uh, like the superintendent, uh, like a woman named Kalmu Shashe, who ran an Afrocentric school in her home that took me under their wing and that taught me about this movement, um, that taught me about their history and legacy as activists and community organizers, and introduced me to a lot of um, what we do today in service learning, community-based research, et cetera. But essentially, my experiences were and we'll get to this later, very developmental. <laughs> like I, I was a tutor and mentor, but then I was given opportunities to take on more leadership and responsibility, including to craft ways that faculty would do more study service connections. And by the time I was a senior, I was working with some peers on creating a course that was taught by community residents in East Palo Alto, but that had credit. So, uh, I'll, I'll share more about our model later, but it was definitely those experiences that shaped my sense of civic agency and community responsibility. Over to you, Paul. Sure. So I'm Paul Shadwald. Um, I want to apologize ahead of time. My internet at the co-working site seems a little unstable. So if I disappear, it's not that I'm uh, running away. It's just that the internet's unstable and I'll get back on. So the story I wanted to share is a little bit about 
work that I did at McAllister with as part of our Lilly initiative through the Lilly endowments. But first to walk back a little bit, um, I personally grew up in a very conservative religious community. So going to college for me was a gigantic step uh, into the future where I had to really think about how to ask deep and meaningful questions and entertain things like doubt and learning about others and embracing that aspect of different ways that people move through the world and make meaning of it. So when I started to work at McAllister College, we received a grant from the Lilly Foundation to create a project or multiple projects over several years that will help students engage in questions of values, purpose, and meaning. And McAllister isn't a place that's a religious institution. So it opened up this kind of question. How do you help answer and ask these questions? People engage these questions across lines of difference and in a setting where people really um, come at it from lots of different ways, where there's not one particular um, foundation or grounding to the institution. And so we helped set up a program called Lives of Commitment, where 30, 30 incoming students uh, who applied to be part of the program who are willing to take risks to ask questions about meaning, purpose, values, what, what should an education be about? What is an education for? Um, they did small group work in the community because we didn't want it just to be interior focus. We want it to be done through action and a sense of togetherness. And what we tried to do was create what we call a mentoring community, knowing that students could be brave to ask those questions, but that mentoring would come from multiple levels and multiple different ways, including from community members where community members may be more resonant with the students than people on their own campus. And that's helped lead me to other kind of questions in my life, such as where are those mentoring communities for people who aren't in college? And how do young adults in particular find places where they can have those kinds of rich, deep mentoring environments? And um, that's my story. And so now this is an opportunity for you to tell a little bit about your stories. And so what we're gonna be doing is Ari, as we're thinking in the background right now, Ari is, um, setting it up so that we can divide into pairs. And what we'd like each pair to do um, is to prompt to say one sort of example from your own life as a student, as a um, professional, as an academic, where you have developed that uh, or, or had that experience of developing identity and agency and um, any kind of lessons that you can pull from that. And um, what we're gonna do then is then we're gonna get back together after the small groups and think about what we heard and if there's any kind of larger themes or larger frameworks that we can pull out of that. And we hope you stay with us uh, uh, as, as we will then move into some frameworks. Thank you so much. Here we go into groups.